My name is Renee Smith, and I am the founder of the Addicism PR and Brand Development, and you're online with the Online Prosperity Show. Today, we're going to be talking about the four-day work week and how to implement that into different kinds of businesses and what to look out for so that you make sure that you're prepared when you're going to integrate it. Welcome to the Online Prosperity Show, where we explore the secrets of success and prosperity in this modern digital age. I'm your host, Prosper Taruvinga, and today I have a special guest who is revolutionizing the way we work and challenging the traditional norms of the corporate world. Renee, how are you doing? Hello. I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's exciting. Fantastic. I hope we didn't have to wake you up because you're all the way in England there and we're just finishing our day here in Australia. But that doesn't obviously stop us doing the work that we love. And that's the reason why we have you on the show today. Now, for those that are meeting Renee for the first time, uh, pity on you because she is a celebrity and she was just telling me earlier how she is part of, um, she's a former MasterChef contestant and now has a TV show of her own, but that's not her claim to fame. She's actually the founder of the Artism, an award-winning award-winning full-service agency that specializes in public relations, uh, marketing, social media, and brand development. And um, not only has she done the stint on MasterChef, she also has an impressive background in PR, brand development, And she's worked with companies across Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, Europe, and um, uh, all around the world. Now, Renee, thank you so much. (laughs) I'm even getting tongue twisted trying to. I've never felt so more proud of myself, actually. (laughs) What a fantastic (laughs) intro. I need to charge more. I've decided now. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Now, tell us a little bit about your sort of background and um, what sort of prompted you to start your own PR agency. Sure. Yeah. So I started my career mostly in law. I actually worked in law for um, most of my younger life, um, training as a paralegal. Um, But I had two kids of my own. And um, so I guess trying to make ends meet, I was doing a side hustle where I was writing a lot of articles for Concrete Playground and Urban List and those sorts of like publications in Australia, as well as doing restaurant reviews. So I was doing that on the side. And then throughout my reports, I started kind of taking liberties, I guess, and suggesting ways that they could improve. Um, And it was only after I started doing that for a while that a lot of companies would approach me and say, do you like, can you do that for us? Can you can you implement those things? And then I was like, what am I doing? I could have my own business. So basically, um, I quit law and started the public relations agency just with the kind of goal of doing it a little bit differently. I'm obviously not formally trained in public relations or marketing or any of those things. But I thought, you know, I don't think this is rocket science. I'm going to use common sense. And I, I went about it that way. So it's been nearly 13 years now, and it has worked very well. So um, we started in Australia in 2012, and we opened in the UK in 2019-20. COVID kind of blurred that a little bit. And then I um, am in the process of opening up a little satellite office in Dubai at the moment. Wow, congratulations. And that really (laughs) stems from you just choosing your own path. You know, first of all, no qualifications in the whole space, which is proof positive that you know you can be doing have a happier existence as long as you can um you know collaborate with other people now pr has a lot to do with um you know collaboration and working with people so to speak what has been sort of your major highlights in this career so far um i think for me so one of the one of the highlights of the career was we were um awarded in Australia Mumbrella is obviously a large corporation and we were up against huge corporations and we were a finalist for best PR employer yeah and so all the other agencies had like you know 50 100 people the big ogilvies and then there was our tiny little group of six <laughs> um and we yeah we were I was in, I, I was a finalist. I came third for best PR employer. And, and that was like a huge moment for me because I thought, oh, I really wanted to make a place where people enjoy coming to work. I think that that's this myth. People are like, no one would ever enjoy coming to work, but I really wanted to do that. 
So that was like a personal achievement for me, knowing that I was on the right track with what I was doing for my staff. But then I think um, when you get, cons- like, for example, I've worked with the Hong Kong government who asked me to consult about building a brand new development on the harbour. So when you get an inquiry like that, that's when you start going in your mind like, oh, my God, people actually think I know what I'm doing and they trust me. And that starts to really kind of build your trust in yourself and makes me realise that, yes, I might not have had the formal training, but my ideas work and I know what I'm talking about. So you start that that's like a shift in in, in my whole career. Absolutely. And congratulations. I mean, when you mentioned you. Umbrella, I obviously was in shock because there are such a big brand and if you say you were up in arms with people like Ogilvy and uh, all the rest of them then that's you know kudos to you for literally um, you know turning this whole thing upside its head and now the award that you were um, you know uh, in line for was for best uh, employer to your six um, uh, people. And uh, now you've gone on and, you know, broken all traditional norms and uh, instigated the four-day work week at um, Atticism. Tell us a little bit about what that is and what that looks like within your business. Yeah, sure. So um, basically a few years ago, I'll give you the background. A few years ago, we tried to implement a 20-hour work week um, and that was for senior staff. So um, there was a lot of coverage around it. Uh, and that was me trying before all of this four day work week became cool. I was thinking, how do I make people's lives better? <laughs> um, and so I let them choose the 20 hours a week that they would be in the office. And then they had a further 10 to 15 hours that I was happy for them to do outside of the office, wherever they felt that they be- worked best. They didn't have to be locked to a computer. It could be meetings, whatever, but 20 hours only in the office. The headache with that came from. Some staff don't work well without uh, structure. They just don't. And and I think that under, I didn't at that point understand that there were different personalities that would work with different structures. So we had probably about four or five of the staff really struggle because they weren't setting themselves good boundaries or timelines and the work just kind of fell apart until I had to go, okay, no, 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 we're not going to do that anymore. Um Then we implemented Mondays and Fridays as work from home days. So you only had to come into the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, which gave it a bit more solidity so that people knew exactly what was going on. Um, And then earlier this year, I basically, like, it sort of stems from the fact that I would love to have Fridays off. (laughs) So I was like, surely other people would as well. So I, I called a meeting with everybody and I said, right, let's trial the four day work week. So that would be Monday to Thursday in the office from eight to five with an hour for lunch. I'm, I'm also not rigid on that. Like they're allowed to go to meetings before work. Like it's just a guideline. But Friday's completely off as in don't answer your phone, don't look at emails. That that was the rule is that I wanted them to commit to actually not being online so that I could work out whether this trial was working or not. And so I said, you're not being forced to do the trial, but if you'd like to do it, let me know. And we had a split 50-50. Half of the office wanted to try it. The other half wanted to stay with the Monday to Friday work from home. So I thought, perfect, actually, this is a great test for me, isn't it? So um, we implemented it. And now we've actually had the people who were doing the five days see how the four-day work week's working for everyone else. And now everybody's going to be moving over from mid-July to the four-day work week. Fantastic. And obviously, you know, you're dealing with people with lives outside of, you know, uh, work and everything else. Now, did you maybe notice a uh, significant difference in maybe their productivity or work quality after you started transitioning with them to this uh, four day work week? So I think the short answer is no, it was the same. And I think that that is telling in the sense that I that they're happier. So I've noticed they're happier. So they, when they come in on Monday, they're full of energy. The team meetings on Monday are actually way more vibrant than they used to be because they've had those three days off. Um, but I also noticed that each day is fuller. So I'm noticing that obviously because they're trying to get the amount of work that they would normally do in one week in four days, nobody seems to be burning out, but everybody's getting the work done. So then I was like, this is fine. So I I have, I know a lot of companies have reported higher productivity or this or that or the other, 
I have just noticed that it hasn't affected productivity at all, but it has affected positively my staff's well-being, which I think in turn, we haven't been doing it for more than two months now. So I think in turn, this is going to potentially affect their productivity. But for now, everybody's just kind of like adapting to it. But the fact that the the 50% of staff who didn't do it now want to do it also shows me that they've seen it as well. They've looked and gone, hang on a minute, that looks good. I want that. So I think it definitely speaks for itself that, that they're choosing to do it. I'm not forcing it on them. Absolutely. I mean, it is a matter of choice. And um, if people are given a choice, then they would choose what's really good for them. And um, personally, I mean, if you look at my hands, no two fingers of the same height, um, you know, no no two fingers on the same hand of the same height. Um, And you did mention that a few people were finding it very difficult because they lacked that structure. Do you still find that is still the case or have people now gotten accustomed to what what is now the Mm. the way of life for them, the new norm, so to speak? So I think I'm lucky that everybody on the team right now is quite structured in their approach. Um, It is some different people than when we tried that 20 hour work week years and years ago. Um, One staff member, particularly, I have noticed she lacks the ability to turn off. So I noticed that she works too much, I think. I know that that's a weird thing for a boss to say, but I regularly, when I log in on the UK, obviously it's later in Australia. And then I notice that it's midday here and she's still working. And I have to go, turn your computer off, stop. Like it's done today, stop doing it. So that what I'm noticing is like some stuff, really adjust very quickly and go right I'm doing eight to five and that's the end of it and they turn it off and they they are capacity other stuff um the only problem I've got at the moment is the opposite of what I used to have now they're like oh working too much and so I really um remind people every week this is not a four-day work week where you then also check your emails on Friday you have to stop like you have to turn it off um and so that's something that she's trying to learn because she keeps saying, oh, but I, just, I don't mind. I like doing it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not, we're not doing that. <laughs> so again, um, it's a completely different problem than I had before, but it's still, for me, I believe a problem because you don't want staff that are working 10, 12 hour days. It's not sustainable. It's also, I think, unfair. So that's something I'm keeping an eye on now because uh, I definitely don't want to be like pushing them into that hustle culture because that's just not what I believe is is effective. Oh, I can imagine, you know, with the world, fast paced world that we live in, it's just, um, you know, a a culture that people will think is a sustainable thing. But, you know, given the last couple of years, you can notice that um, people are much more productive and creative if they clock around them to tell them when to start and when to stop. Now, you actually alluded to something that's of interest here because you have crossovers between time zones. You did mention yeah. you've got stuff in Australia. Um, yeah. You know, how does that then, you know, work together or align with, because right now it's already uh, end of day and you guys are starting your day and wouldn't that infringe into somebody else's four day um, you know, um, yeah. work day while they're trying to align with different time zones. And I, I just need to find that out. Yeah, that. no, that, that makes sense. So so the way that it works is um, I, I wake up at 6 every day, which is 3 p.m. in Australia. So right. what what the rule is, is we have, we use a lot of, so I, okay, let me start from the beginning. I moved to France in 2017 with the purpose of spending a year abroad so that I could make the office work without me in it. So it was, it was always a goal of me that, you know, I always thought if I create a business that just creates a job for me, then I may as well just get a job. I wanted to create a business where I was the founder, where I had a, a, an executive role. So I moved to France as a, a kind of a forced hand of like, how will this work without me? And what are the problems? So I did that and very quickly was able to kind of identify ways to make the office run better. And a lot of that is by use of programs. So we have account management programs. We use Slack, like a lot of digital stuff to track what we're doing. So the way that it works now is I wake up early enough that I catch them at the end of their day. And we have a very specific channel in Slack that is called For Renee First. And it's what I look at first, because obviously when I wake up, I've got 150 emails from the day. So I don't look at those. I look at Slack 
I answer all of my staff's questions. If they want to have a call with me, they also have a direct link to book that call so that they know when I sit at my desk, I'm there, I can talk to them. And we solve all of those problems by the time they finish work. And then the rule is they do not, unless I text them specifically on their text phone, they do not have to answer a single message or Slack message or anything from me until they are at work again the next day. So we have this very kind of like a trustful system where they know that I can get them if if I desperately need to. And I don't, I never do. Like, let's be fair. One night's not going to kill somebody if they have to wait. Um, But yeah, but so it's, again, just putting those boundaries in so that they know that I respect their time. And I I don't expect when I'm sitting here at 2 p.m. in my, my time and they're getting emails, like they need no to mute their, mute their system. So yeah, it's just been about putting in those boundaries so that they know that their work day is not my work day. Fantastic. I like how you've got it all um, seamless and the, you know, the advent of technology just makes it all the much easier and good on yeah. you for uh, making it easy for your uh, employees. You should have won that Mumbrella award. Right. <laughs> right? Uh, Maybe uh, I'll enter again. And <laughs> I'm, uh, no, definitely. I'm going to have to have a word with one of the organizers. <laughs> so they have that. No, that, this might seem all well and good, uh, Renee, when it comes to, um, you know, how you've made it work within your business. But your business also caters to other businesses, you know, yeah. and you've worked in different, um, you know, time zones. You've worked in different continents. Um, you know what I mean? And that mm. might also pause or cause a bit of uh, feather ruffling there. Have you yeah. faced any sort of resistance or maybe skepticism from other companies, especially maybe the ones that you work with or other industry professionals regarding your four day work week? Because maybe they rang somebody at the office and nobody picked up their phone on Friday, whereas yeah. they wanted to have something go on, um, you know, to market on, on Monday. Yeah. Address. Totally. Um, that, that's been my biggest fear, to be honest. That has been the biggest concern is our, our clients specifically. We work with a lot of clients in hospitality as well. And obviously the weekends are their busy time. Like is us not being there on a Friday going to hurt, which we haven't. Like I guess the, the short answer is we haven't had any complaints. We haven't had any problems. Again, I think this comes down to um, not to blow my own trumpet, but predicting what might happen and then setting up st- strategies. So we have a, our staff have always been very clear, like I'm going to be trialing a four day work week. Please give me feedback. So we set up an automatic jot form survey that goes to the clients that if they have a problem, they can put it in there and it comes to me and then I'll talk to them about it. We haven't had a single client do that, but I also put into play different um email deliverables so our account managers on monday must before 11 a.m check in with each client and say hope your weekend was great this is what i'm doing this week and then on thursday before 11 they have to say this is what i've done this week i'm off tomorrow this is what i'm doing next week if there's anything outstanding you've got the rest of the day to talk to me otherwise i'll be getting on with this I think that a lot of the time when clients have problems, especially with potentially not being able to contact someone on a Friday, it's because they weren't aware or because they didn't feel that they were fully part of the process. So as much as possible, I always try to keep our account managers accountable to the client and to prompt feedback and to prompt like, I'm not going to be here tomorrow, just a reminder. Um, I think that that has alleviated a lot of the problems Like we work for um, the biggest independent telecommunications company in Australia, Mate. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. Um, yeah, and that's a huge corporation. And he was actually so on board. With, I was worried that he was going to be like, oh, God, you know, we're paying a fair amount of money for you to manage us and you're not going to be there on Fridays. But he was like, I love it. And Emma is like, Emma, her, the account manager is amazing. Like, he's just so happy um, that I, it just made me go, okay, I think if if people know and if people understand what's happening, they're very less likely to have any problems with it. Of course, that may come up in the future. I don't know for sure, but we're very clear about the process of this is how we will be managing your account. This is when we will be updating you. And these are your opportunities to get back to us. So it's all about structure. I'm a huge, like, flexible structure, but there is definitely structure to what the way that I run the business. 
Absolutely. And it's not a business if you're tethered to your phone or tethered to your computer and you mm-hmm. can't be where you want to be, you know, um, and the business still manages to run itself. Now, it looks like you've got standard operating procedures that are put in place uh, in this whole operation. And um, also with what I'm getting to understand now, Renee, this is maybe very much a, a, a personal thing this is all Mm -hmm. you do you think this is something that any other entrepreneur can literally watch this video take notes go on slack and get started by tomorrow um you know bringing their stuff in monday to thursday and nobody ring him on friday (laughs) i think anyone can do it yes but i think again the key is prep I, I think I don't think they could start next week. No, I think you need to really sit down and audit your operations, audit the p- procedures you've got into place, and again audit your staff because I don't think that it works for every staff. And I think that as an owner, you need to look at what works best for your staff and your clients, um, and trial it. But my biggest suggestion would be tell your clients and tell your staff we're going to try this for a month. And then actively, actively every week invite feedback because as an owner, feedback is the only way you learn. And I think brutal feedback from your staff saying, we don't like it, we like this, we like that. And clients being able to feel that they can be honest with you, you can then start to get a really clear picture of what's going to work for your business or what's lacking in the procedural rollout for that sort of a thing so that then you can kind of approach it much more advised of what's going to be a good idea or not. Absolutely. See, I've I've trialed it within my own household. We've got a two day kinder, um, you know, week with my yeah. four year old, and every time she goes to kinder Mondays and Tuesdays, she's she's okay. But yeah, the rest of the week she forgets that she has to go yeah. to school on Monday, and then we have to start all over again. Um. So, <laughs> I can yeah. imagine. <laughs> Obviously, with adults, it's a whole different story. But yeah, um, yeah I'm just thinking how yeah. it might actually work with um, sort sort of people. No, you've you know really proven the case, and you've really lived uh, this four hour work week. And um, you know, mm. you've got a case study, which is your business and things yeah. of that nature. Um, how can maybe people um, you know learn from you, or what is it that you can offer people that uh, maybe have questions, um, you know, yeah. as to how they can do this? Um, have you created a course? Have you created an open line? What what is it that people can maybe do that are watching this show right now to yeah. to learn from you? I, I mean, I don't have a course. <laughs> there are a lot of interviews with me out there about um, the importance of policy and procedure. I, I, I am huge on that. And I think probably about four years ago, that became so obvious to me that that is what, what so many companies are missing. Um, and I think understanding the strategic side of what's going on with your business. So, I mean, second to this, we just created a service called a discovery audit. The whole purpose of it was so that companies that potentially weren't sure where their company was going wrong can come to us and we can go, okay, this is working, this is working, this is working, this isn't working, what about changing that? Have you looked at this? And get that third-party look at what at your company, identify the problems, identify the, the pain points between everybody. Um, and I think that that's what people would need to take from this is that it's not just a one-size-fits-all. You can't just do it overnight. You can't just look at it I think read all the different case studies there's like there's it's not even just about productivity you have to look at like how does it affect your staff's annual leave what are you going to do if a public holiday falls on a Friday are you going to pay your staff or are you not going to pay your staff these are all like decisions you really have to make and you have to go okay this has to be a company-wide discussion and um it's not it's not just something you can implement overnight I I mean I did that with the 20-hour work week one week we didn't have it the next week we did and it went up in a bunch of flames so the one thing is prepare read prepare try it speak to everybody and and have a plan fantastic and thank you so much for opening the doors to that communication there now somebody might be sitting here renee and they're rolling their eyes so far back they can even see the (laughs) breakfast that they uh had this morning um 
and they probably thinking, nah, this might never work in my industry. You know, yeah. I'm a, I'm a florist, you know, I can't tell people I can't send flowers today because it's not my yeah. work day. Are there any specific industries or types of uh, companies that you believe are better suited for this uh, four day work week and, and why? I'm, I think so emergency services obviously like that's an obvious one like there are there are certain industries yeah it can't but you could put your staff on four days you know you have to be open maybe all the time but you could alternate staff and that is something that I've also learned for a retail store that needs to be open seven days you could potentially offer the staff staggered weeks so some do Monday to Thursday some do Wednesday to Sunday that is an option that uh, that happens a lot in retail anyway but if it was for a, a single owner, for example, at like you gave with a florist and they really just wanted to try the, the four-day work, work week, if you alert people, there is this wonderful thing in business where if they can't get something they want, a lot of the times people want it more. So I think that there is a change in perception that you can control where potentially if you're not always available, if a client calls you on a Friday and you're not available, they get used to it and the world doesn't end. And it's this beautiful discovery that you make that it's okay. Like it's okay not to be available all the time. And I'm living proof that it doesn't matter. Like nothing goes wrong and everybody just goes, oh yeah, that's right. I forgot she's not working Friday. We'll check it on Monday. And it just, yeah, just try it. I, that would be my thing. And, at the, you know, I was busy five days a week. I truly was. I was working from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m., five days a week. Now I do it four days a week and I'm just the same amount of busy, but now I get an extra day off, but nothing's fallen off. And it's, and it is just like, okay, that just seems to work. So I just think, try it. You know, it does, it seems a bit of all ridiculousness and like, why are we doing this? But I can only say that once you try it, I think you, your eyes kind of open to like, yeah, if we all did it and we all respected that we need more time for ourselves or for our families or for downtime, I think that would be a great I sound like a bit of a guru here, but a great universal shift in the way that we approach work-life balance. And I think that that's, I think it's heading that way and it's exciting, I think. Absolutely. Well, you are a guru in my eyes, especially <laughs> when you bring in new wisdom and new concepts like this, because while you're talking, I was actually just equating all of this to, you know, that, I don't know what the name for it in English is. If someone mm. has a dollar, they will spend yeah. up to 75 cents. If someone has yeah. $2, they will spend up to a dollar 75. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it just depends on what you've been given. If you yeah. have 24 hours to complete a task, you will use all the 24 hours. If you've got 12, guess what's going to happen? You're going to complete that task within that sort of time frame. Exactly. And, and you know, that's exactly what I found. That is exactly what it is. I, I just, I, there's probably less faff. And we have like in the office now we have silent time. So that's something we implemented because we knew that we had to get more done. So between 10 and 12 is silent time. So no chatter, you know, and and like the staff want that, but that's because we now know that we've got this focus time of like get your work done before lunch. And then I don't mind if there's chatter. So yeah, you find ways to make it work. If you want that extra day off bad enough, you are going to find ways to balance it. And then as it happens, you slowly get more perspective on the fact that actually I don't care if somebody wants to reach me on a Friday and you you start prioritizing your wellness and it just shifts everything. And then because you've shifted, the way that people treat you shifts as well and it starts to all even out. Oh, fantastic. Because how you do anything is how you do everything. And the way you show up in the world, if you show up calm, cool and collected, everything else just flows through like right. that. And I'm happy I had a smile when you showed up on the Zoom because then we wouldn't have had this um, okay. magnificent show uh, to, <laughs> to, you know, to, to, to boot. Now, you've been doing this for, for a while now. And you yeah. also did mention that you trialed out the 20 hour work week and then now you've got the full uh, day work week. And you, you know, you mentioned that this has been happening maybe four four years prior or something, something yeah. like that. Now, how do you sort of envision um, the future of work and the potential impact, um, you know, of this alternative work model, like this um, four day work week we've been talking about? Yeah. I think it can go one of two ways. I have thought about this. So I think that 
if it's universally adopted as like a, a new norm, and I do feel like that's probably where it is heading, I think that it could potentially, like I said, shift the way that people view um, their free time. I think that shift has happened a bit since COVID. You know, people complain about Gen Z and blah, blah, blah. They, they all, they are, you know, what does this job do for me? And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, but I think maybe the pendulum swung a little bit too far that way. And we've got to settle somewhere nice in the middle where work is also important and doing your best at work is important, but also your private life is important. So that's where I think it could be heading. The only other problem that I do see is that you still have your grinders and your hustlers out there who are promoting that lifestyle. So there could be, as often happens in the world, that segregation. And I think we may have your like what they would perceive like la dadi four-day work week hippies with the hardcore grinders and I think then as you're a younger person you're going to probably have to choose and um, for example the girl that works for me that is a grinder and a hustler she would automatically be drawn to that lifestyle which I'm not necessarily sure is the best for her so I would be worried about a segregation and a potential um, inequality of opportunity for people who may want to prioritize that four-day work week because then they may not be employed by someone like in the hustler grinder group so That would be my concern is that, you know, it's going to fracture the society a little bit, but I don't know. I guess I can't see into the future too much, but all I know is I guess I'm going to, I'm going to fight my fight and try and kind of do the best that I can for people to have that balance. I think it will make a much better world. I sound like John Lennon, but I do, I do. I truly believe that we'll all be like, once we realize it doesn't matter, just calm down a little bit, then I think we'll just be much more happy. Oh, absolutely. And I love that sentiment because at the end of the day, you can only control what you can control and um, let the algorithms deal with that because yeah. those that are in- inclined to want a certain lifestyle, guess what? The algorithms will bombard them with <laughs> you know, information yeah. that leads them to that. So I really believe we are all living altern- alternate lives uh, and yeah. each and every one of us is just predicated on what is on their news feed on that particular day now sure. we, we could go on and on you know <laughs> and we can't envision what the actual future of everybody else is going to be but i want to know what's next for narcissism and you know do you have any sort of innovative approaches or projects that we can start latching on to because you saw this before it became yeah. a thing, do you know what I mean? Just like the people that saw Zoom before it was a thing, and yeah. uh, now we're just at the tail end of it all. What, 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 what yeah. is next for? Um, um, okay. Well, I mean, for me personally, I'm pregnant, so <laughs> next year, I'm due, thank you. I'm due Christmas Day, so I'm definitely going to be probably relaxing a little bit more next year on the work side of things. But from a business side of things, with that in mind, obviously, I'm a planner. So I'm like, okay, where are we going with this? So I have been identifying, I guess, over the last couple of years, uh, social media has been a pain point for me. Um, Influencers specifically is not something I agree with. Um, And people have always fought me on that and they still want influencers. But I'm starting to see these very big undercurrents of people going, influencers are rubbish. Um, And so I'm starting to implement new strategies with our clients where we look at influencers with influence and influencers for content. So we're segregating um, that sort of a thing. And that's something I'm going to be trying to jump on as quick as I can is um, the anti-influencer sort of bandwagon. But realizing that social media is part of our lives and it's here to stay, but coming up with a very different approach to social media. So that's what I'm working on at the moment is it's it's not what you are used to. It's a very different way of using social media, um, which I think is way more beneficial in the long term. Oh, I love that <laughs> because with the way things are going on, just because you have 10,000 uh, fans or followers doesn't mean you know anything about selling this pen. All right. Exactly. <laughs> At the end of it the drives day. me crazy. You've got 20,000 followers and they think if you eat a hamburger, they're going to bring in 10 people. And it's like, <laughs> you don't even know if their followers like hamburgers. It's so dumb. But yeah, so now I'm kind of, I've got stats. Obviously, I've got a lot of, I've got 25,000 followers myself and I get brands asking me all the time, like, will you post about this? And I say, it's not going to work. No one cares about that, 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 you know, I'm not going to be able to sell your products. But 
here's five thousand dollars for any post about this blanket and I think okay <laughs> if you want but yeah so I'm I'm really working on um different social strategies just yeah that's my my main goal over the next six months Absolutely. Well, I'm really happy we caught you before you got busy. First of all, congratulations on Baba coming um, through. And also you're going to be working with so much uh, industry changing yeah. Um, yeah. stuff because everybody yeah. has been on the bandwagon of influencers for quite a while now. And if you're going to yeah. be shifting that mindset, you're going to need very strong ground to yeah. stand on so you can move the world. Exactly. and. And I've I'm done really... it before, though. So I, I, I was the first person to tell uh, companies to stop using press releases. So we were the first people in Australia that said press releases are rubbish, don't do it. And we got so much hate for all for that. And so now me saying influencers are rubbish, I know I know what's coming, but I also know that you give it a couple of years. Give it a couple of years and you'll see. <laughs> Absolutely. So, well, like yeah. you mentioned, you know, a lot of bigger businesses have put systems and processes in place. So when you come in and say, hey, what you guys have been doing is wrong, they're not only disputing that particular fact, they are also fighting for whatever they've created behind the scenes because it's going to take a redemptive amount of time, money and effort for them to recalibrate to whatever exactly. it is that you're talking about. Because if they yeah. were already having a system, people, setups and processes to churn out uh, PR releases or press releases, yeah. then if you tell them, no, now you have to do it on social media. Now they're going to have to learn that, get people yeah. in and they're just fighting for their incompetences. So good on exactly. you for, uh, you know, choosing to disrupt uh, this whole setup. And I can't wait to be supporting uh, you and your team uh, behind the scene. And uh, I really appreciate your time today on the call. No worries. Uh, Thanks for having me. It's been a good chat. Thank you. Absolutely. And there you have it. An insightful conversation with Renee Smith, who's the founder of Atticism, about the transformative transformative power of the four day work week. Now, Renee, like I said, thank you so much. You've shared with us your experience and your expertise, and we can't wait to see what you've got in store in the future and look forward to seeing how um, artisticism is going to continue to thrive and inspire others in this industry. Thank you. Now to our listeners, thank you so much for tuning into the Online Prosperity Show. As you heard from Renee, you know, new technologies, new uh, disruptions are coming and you can only just tune into the Online Prosperity uh, Show to be able to learn and be ahead of the curve. Now, until next time, remember when we challenge the status quo and embrace innovative ideas, we pave way for a prosperous future. Bye for now.